Side. It's easier in a way to play without having it on. I think what I'm going to do. We know you. We recognize you. I think what I'm going to do is put them on while they're hopefully they'll play a long one during the offering. <laughs> put them on that time for communion. Okay. <laughs> Unless you think I'd it'd be better to be okay. It's it's a change up today. Do you know it is. It is a change up day. <laughs> and generally, I wear my vestments, but. <laughs> <clears throat> What's that? It's summertime in the living is That's right. That's right. It is. It's the green and green is the color. If it were white or something. <laughs>
Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to welcome you to worship on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. I debated this morning about whether to put my vestments on, but I'm going to be, uh, by the grace of the musicians, sitting in to strum along a little bit with them this morning, and it's easier to do without wearing that. So I think what I'll do is uh, change uh, while you guys are doing the offering and and be vested for the sacrament, but not for the beginning of the service, if you'll excuse me for that. I don't do that very often, but it's a day for, as they said, changing up here. Um, I want to begin this morning by introducing some guests to you, because we have a really wonderful opportunity to uh, be benefit of some musical talent that we don't always have around. And I'm going to ask Jill if she'll start the introductions, because she's related to most of those folks here who are. <laughs> Jill, would you tell us who's here this morning? Uh, so we have my, my big sister Sue and her husband Dennis, middle sister Lisa and her husband John. Oh, are, Sue and Dennis are out of the forest, Lisa and John are, their church is in Lake Mills, they now live in Jefferson, briefly, before they came to Florida. So that's mine. That's them, welcome, welcome. Regularly play at Lake Mills, right? Yeah, so we're, I don't know, um, not very often church musicians get a Sunday off, but we're glad that you're here this morning. And then I have guests of my own to introduce to you. Uh, you know my wife, Lynn, and sitting next to them are my brother, Peter, and his wife, Karen. And uh, I told you that I'm the oldest of four brothers, and the youngest is a pastor, and the middle two are musicians in churches. So like everybody else here, having them off on a Sunday is kind of an unusual thing. So we're glad to have them here, and they're going to share some music as well this morning. Uh, they belong to our Savior's Lutheran Church in Circle Pines, Minnesota, which is a northern, far northern suburb of the Twin Cities. And uh, so it's good, good to have them with me this morning. I want to make some announcements this morning. First of all, um, I want to emphasize again to you uh, two still pretty new Bible study opportunities. We're met, meeting here on Wednesday nights. Uh, at the church to look ahead each Wednesday at the readings we're going to be sharing in worship on Sunday. And I think that's helpful. So we'd love to have you be part of that Bible study on Wednesday night at 6.30 here at the church. And then we just started something new that I'm kind of anxious about and excited about this week. And that is that Thursday night we had our first Bible study at the Hubbleton Brewing Company. Um, I was thinking that probably all the church people will come here and say, why are we in a brewery? And all the brewery people will come here and say, why are we doing a Bible study? So um, that's probably a good thing if we can get those people all together, I think. It's an opportunity to uh, enlarge the outreach of the gospel, perhaps. But I need your help. And that is by passing it on to people that you know who might be interested and maybe even putting your toe in the water and trying it out yourself too. Now we had a good time this last Thursday. We had a real Bible study, but we didn't have an overwhelming crowd. So it'd be nice to, to have more folks there for that. And then I am really excited about the announcement uh, that the call committee is going to be meeting this week with the assistant to the bishop and maybe the bishop too, who will be here to help us to really put the call process into gear and uh, begin moving forward a little faster. So that's exciting. Uh, we'll hear reports, I'm sure, next week from the call committee on what that was like and, and what they're doing. So keep them in your prayers. And then also take a look at the announcement that is in the bulletin about 
um, some things that are going to happen to move us a little bit more towards normalcy when we are heading into September. Uh, some things that have to do with those people who are involved in worship leadership and ushers, and, for example. So pay attention to that. I'm excited about that. Um, and I'm praying that that's what happens, but also be aware of the fact that if things change and things could change, uh, then our plans will have to change. Um, you see that Jill is wearing a mask this morning. That's because she is being careful about someone that she's going to be with who uh, might be particularly uh, vulnerable. And that's good stewardship. That's Christian love. So if we need to do that together as God's people, uh, we'll do that together. And I have one story to tell. I was trying to think if I should tack this onto the sermon or tell it now. But I think I'll tell it now. You get two sermons for the price of one today. Um, back about a year and a half ago, maybe a little more now, when the COVID epidemic was really hitting hard in France, the uh, Roman Catholic bishop of the Diocese of Normandy, the part of France that's along the English Channel, announced that they would uh, for the time being, suspend in-person worship services. And a small town Roman Catholic church in Normandy in France um, had a lot of the parishioners get upset with that decision, that they were not going to worship in person for a while. And uh, parishioners went to the priest of that parish and said, surely if we're worshiping and uh, we are believers, God will protect us from this. Uh, isn't God's power stronger than the power of the COVID virus? And that wise priest said, um, that's not faith. Um, that's tempting God. Um, remember that when Jesus was in the wilderness confronted by Satan. Satan said, uh, throw yourself off here and the angels will catch you. God won't let anything happen to you. Um, you're important. God loves you. God has the power to protect you, doesn't he? Jump off and you'll be fine. And what does Jesus say to that? He doesn't say, oh yes, of course. I, I have faith. I trust that the Father will protect me. I'll jump off. No, Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And this priest used that story. Um, and the reason I'm telling this today is because uh, Lynn was telling me about hearing a case of a pastor who said that he would not allow anybody to come into his church who was wearing a mask because God would protect those people. Um, but uh, that's not faith. That's tempting God. And we have Jesus' own example for that. And uh, so I, this parish has been very cautious. Right now we're not masking, most of us, most of the time. Uh, but we were very careful, and we may go back to being careful at some point. Um, and people will say, well, aren't you believers? Don't you trust God? We do trust God. But we also know that uh, uh, there's a difference between that tempting God. Huh? So I just wanted to share that story with you. So let's begin our worship this morning. And uh, if you'd pick up that red book that's in front of you, we're going to begin in the front of that book at page 94, the very beginning of it. <clears throat> I don't know about you. But I come into worship most times carrying a little burden of uh, things that I have done or left undone that I should or shouldn't have, and I uh, need the opportunity to, to hear about God's grace again. So if you would, wouldn't mind standing, 
We'll begin with the confession that's on page 94. So we begin, and we're in the left-hand column. We begin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness and grace, uh, receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. And brothers and sisters, the sweet good news of the gospel is that in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. And I think that means it's time for us to sing. And so we're going to ask the musicians if they will help us. And maybe just for this time, we'll usually we stand to sing, but I'm going to let you sit so you can kind of. Don't wait for me, I'll catch up. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Or walk the sing along as we praise him in song. Darkness, my God, that is 
who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. You never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Well, it's fun to have them here, isn't it, this morning? Thanks for the music and. Uh, we anticipate the rest of it too. Wonderful stuff. So congregation, if you pick up that red book again, we're going to continue at uh, page 98. tuned up my guitar, but I didn't open the book. <laughs> so I invite you to stand, brothers and sisters. It's my privilege to greet you this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. Oh God, eternal goodness, immeasurable love, you place your gifts before us we eat and are satisfied. Fill us and this world in all its need with the life that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated as we turn to the scriptures this morning. First reading comes from Exodus, one little scene from the time of wandering in the wilderness. The people of Israel were rescued from slavery and they were rescued again at the Red Sea when God opened the way for them. And now they're out in the wilderness and they're hungry. And uh, suddenly, as they do a lot, they started to complain. Exodus chapter 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a way to reflect on that. I'll invite you to read this piece of Psalm 78 with me. I'll read the odd-numbered verses and ask you to read the even-numbered verses. So God commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. So mortals ate the bread of angels. God provided for them food enough. Lord, 
raining down flesh upon them like dust, and flying birds like the sand of the seas. So the people ate and were filled, for God gave them what they craved. Second reading is from Ephesians. We've been reading through the book of Ephesians these Sunday mornings, and we're in the fourth chapter, at the beginning of the fourth chapter now. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working pro properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We don't have uh, Elizabeth with us here this morning to play our Alleluia for us. And uh, so I'm just going to ask you to stand, if you would, for the gospel reading. We'll say that this Holy Gospel for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost comes from the 6th chapter of John. And you can say, Glory to you, Lord. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they say to him, What must we do to, be, to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors gave the manna in the wilderness, as it was written, he gave them bread from heaven. <coughs> then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The gospel of the Lord. Amen. Praise you, Lord. You may be seated. Here. <laughs> so 
see their taxes that the musicians play it and then have to go through the whole thing. <laughs> So, brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you. Peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, we're reading the second part of four parts of the same chapter in the Gospel from John chapter 6. It's a long chapter. Last week we began the reading. After today, two more weeks, we're going to be reading in the same gospel. And in that gospel, Jesus is using a long illustration about who he is. I am the bread of life, he says. So let me remind you of something that I said last week, because it's an important little line that comes early in the sixth chapter of John. Just this little line, it says, Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. We should underline and put in bold and in red the word the, the festival of the Jews. In fact, Passover for Jews and Jesus Day, like I said, was what Christmas and Easter and the 4th of July are for us all wrapped together. Everybody in the crowd around Jesus that day would have been aware that the Passover was almost upon them, just like we can't possibly lose track December 20th that Christmas is about to come, huh? Everybody would have been making holiday plans and preparations, and most especially they would have been making plans for the Passover Seder, that meal that happens in Jewish homes where they feast together and tell the story of the Exodus while they're doing it. And most important for the Passover Seder, is to have the matzah, the bread, the unleavened bread that reminds the people of Israel of the manna that God sent them in the wilderness. God said, don't worry, every day I'll take care of you. You'll go out and you'll find this stuff, and I love the name manna because it comes right from the first morning that the people of Israel went out and they looked on the ground and, and they said, manna, manna and he reads, what is it? This is the bread God has given you, Moses said. <clears throat> Every morning for 40 years to see if the people of Israel would trust that God would take care of them day by day. But like they did a lot and like we do a lot, they fell down. Why didn't the people in the wilderness expect more from God? They had been part of that amazing rescue with the plagues that had finally, with the angel of death, convinced Pharaoh to let them go. They'd seen all that. They'd been there at the Red Sea when the army of Pharaoh was coming after them and it looked grim. And God opened a way for them through the Red Sea. They'd seen all of that. You'd think they would have figured by now there was some plan in all of this and that God had their best interest in mind, but they get hungry in the wilderness and they said, oh, we should have stayed in Egypt. At least we had food there. Huh? <clears throat> they can't seem to imagine God being able to do more for them. Let's just go back to Egypt. Let's, you know, it was fun while it lasted, but let's just go back to Egypt. Early in the Passover Seder, and our Jewish friends eat on the first night of Passover, during the telling of the story of the Exodus from Egypt, there's a place where the participants are reminded to say about that 3,000-year-old story this is what God did for me when I came out of Egypt. They're reminded not to say, this is what God did for my ancestors. This is what God did for me. Then the story becomes their story. Living as God's chosen people. And they sing a little song. I don't know if you've ever been to a Passover Seder. If you have the opportunity to miss it. They sing a little song called Dayenu. I even looks at people who that means 
enough. And it's a long little song. If God had only freed us from slavery, Naomi, it would have been enough. If God had only rescued us at the Red Sea, Naomi, it would have been enough. If God had only given us the Ten Commandments, Naomi, it would have been enough. If God had only given us manna in the wilderness, Naomi, it would have been enough. If God had only brought us to the promised land, Naomi, it would have been enough. And the song goes on and on and on to tell the story of God's acts for Israel. And the point of the song is to remind people that God's grace to Israel goes on and on. It's new every day, like manna in the wilderness. Every day, every day, God takes care of his people. Like the people of Israel, the Jewish people, who know the story of how they were rescued in the Exodus, we know the story of our rescue, too. We know about Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, the water, and the word, and the table, and eternal life. So each year when we celebrate our own Christian holidays, maybe we ought to sing that name. If only God had taken on our human flesh and, and, and blood at that land, that he would have been enough. If Jesus had only taught us about God's love in his parables, that he would have been enough. If Jesus had only shown us God's love in the miracles of healing, that he If Jesus had only given himself in bread and wine and the Lord's Supper, that he If Jesus had only suffered for our sake under conscious pilot, that he If Jesus had only died for our sins on Calvary, it would have been Jesus had only risen from the dead. He opened the gates of heaven and eternal life for us. It wouldn't be enough. If Jesus had only ascended into heaven to intercede with us for the Father, Dain, if Jesus had only given the Holy Spirit to be our comfort and life, Dain, if Jesus had only kept his body on the earth of the church, alive and strong through 2,000 years of persecution by his enemies and neglect by his members, Dain, Every Christmas and Easter and Pentecost, we should say, not this is what God did for my ancestors in the manger of the cross and with the wind and fire speaking in tongues that day in Jerusalem, but this is what God did for me. Christians and Jews alike seem to think that whatever day or age we're living in, stuck in the wilderness of the Sinai Desert, stuck in the wilderness of COVID and political strife, somehow we've come to the place where God can't help us anymore. So why don't we expect more from God? Why didn't the Israelites? But what he's done, he's going to continue to take care of us. They don't seem to do that very easily, as we don't seem to do that very easily. Why do we settle for thinking about going back to Egypt to the Sumai rather than seeking and expecting God's love and grace? Here's a thought you might not have been expecting. Could it be that we do what Jesus said the crowds would do? Work for the food that perishes rather than for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of God and the Son of Man did. Like I suppose that is, that we're like that. We're afraid of being disappointed. That somehow the world will look at us and say, look at that, they trusted God, and now see what happened, they end up starving in the wilderness. There a need to somehow protect God. We do that. It's a ridiculous idea. Well, yes, God was adequate to protect his people against horses and chariots, but this is the 21st century. You think God is big enough to do the job now? After all, we're in the age of severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, too. And why do we assume, here's really my point, that we have to work to get what we truly hunger for and seek? Jesus, the crowd, he 
Jesus says to Jesus, what must we do to perform the works of God? That's an interesting question. What must we do to perform the works of God? How much is enough on our part? How do we make sure that we do it right? And the question presses even harder. The stakes are the war and peace, and safety and security, the food and water, health care, the economy, the environment. What must we do to be performing the works of God? Jesus answered to the crowd. If you really look at it, if you really think about it, it might surprise us. This is the work of God. That you believe in God the sent. That's their work, that's our Believe is to trust that God is doing something new that human created conditions and circumstances cannot undermine their faith. To believe is to submit everything, even our high stakes issues, to God's saving work in Jesus. To believe is not so much what we do, as to be open to what God is doing. Now, See, because we have guests today. Here's the place I think where Lutherans have a gift to give to the rest of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I like to think of the church as a choir. You ever sung in a choir? You know, you can't have a choir if all you've got is tenors or albums. You need all the parts in order to have the whole music, right? I think of the church in that way. Each part of the church has some piece to say. I always think the Methodist part is to say, don't forget the poor, God expects you to care for the poor. That's the Methodist part. And the Lutheran part is just one note. Grace, 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 grace. Remember that we didn't earn our salvation. We don't deserve our salvation. There isn't something about us that God decided to save us. It's a free gift of grace. It's God's we get for no reason other than that God loves us and wants to do it. It's pure free gift. Some people joke that the Lutheran understanding of the Christian faith could be summed up like this. Don't just do something, sit there. Don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> But when the crowd asks Jesus, what can we do? Is that kind of like what Jesus tells them? The word of God is to believe. Don't just do something, sit there. Of course, being open to what God is doing and submitting everything to Jesus means that we might not always be doing exactly what we would otherwise judge to be wise or practical or advantageous or even safe. In fact, being open to God and submitting everything to Jesus means that our doing is less important because we are not in charge, let alone in control. God is. <clears throat> now, giving up control is hard for human beings. And we are forever asking, like the crowd around Jesus, to give us a sign let us be the people who don't get vaccinated and never wear masks and still don't get COVID. Then the world would know, wouldn't they, that we are the chosen people. They know about how strong our faith is. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple, Jesus, and the angels will catch you. And then the world will see that you are the Messiah. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. I'm sure we can understand the crowd asking what sign are you giving us so that we can see it in you. Moses had a man in the wilderness, and our ancestors believed him. But Jesus points out that it wasn't Moses, it was God who gave the bread from heaven. What made the feeding a sign was not the bread itself but that it came from God, and that it was God's daily care and God's people. Manna was really only an appetizer for the true bread that came down from heaven, Jesus. 
Jesus is the bread that fulfills all our hunger and thirst. Jesus frees us to follow him, not to achieve self-satisfaction. Oh, you didn't come because you saw the signs. You came because you ate the fill of the bread, Jesus says to them. Not to get anything that is in it for us. Not even to attain or maintain peace of mind. Jesus frees us to embrace God's redeeming will, to restore the world to what God created it and humanity to be what God intended it to be. Faith like that doesn't mean separating the spiritual out of the rest of life. It means putting God at the center of the both. And when we do that, we can and will expect more from God. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus everywhere. Amen. So I had a little song. We sang it once before. I thought that uh, I'd sing it with you again today since I was going to have my guitar here. Um, and I think you've got a little half sheet with it on it. It's a song by Celia Whitaker called Live Christ. I guess I'll stand up and do it. Um, every three years, the ELCA has a youth wide church gathering. There's 30, 32, 35,000 high school kids in one field somewhere. And I've seen Celia Whitaker do this song more than once for that gathering. I've got a picture of something. I'm going to borrow one because we're going to stand right there. Maybe not, you can stand up, you can see me for a while. <laughs> My brother says the difference between a hymn and a praise song is that a hymn has five verses each with a hundred words, and a praise song has a hundred verses each with five words. <laughs> it's a praise song. <laughs> So again, in that green book, at page 105, you'll find the Apostles' Creed, a little sort of Reader's Digest version of the Christian faith that's been used in the church 
for an awful long time to help summarize our belief. So with the whole church, let's confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the God and the Son, and the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pilate, Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we join together in prayer, and uh, there will be some holes in the prayer, some spaces, where I hope that you will include all the joys and sorrows that you came with today, and uh, you might be praying that in your heart, or you might be courageous and speak them out so we can all share them with prayer. So rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. You call your church to be the body of Christ. Awaken all the baptized to the gifts you provide for carrying out the work of ministry. Where the church is divided, knit us together and restore the unity of faith. Hear us, O God. You command the clouds above and cause the wind to blow in the heavens. Watch over deserts and wilderness places. Regenerate rainforests. Defend species at risk of extinction and strengthen the work of conservation organizations. Hear us, O God. We summon leaders to respond to the needs of your people. Instill those who govern with patience when confronted with grievances and perseverance in, see in seeking what promotes the well being of the community. Hear us, O God. We draw near to those who cry out for help, feed those who are hungry, reassure those who are despairing, and accompany those who are imprisoned. Rain down the true bread from heaven that gives life to the world. Hear us, O God. We receive all who come seeking a sign of grace. Make this congregation a place of hospitality for all those accustomed to rejection. To those who have felt excluded here or elsewhere, prepare us to welcome them in the name of Christ. Hear us, O God. Gracious God, you have been faithful for generations to this community that gathers here and calls itself St. Paul. Now in this time of transition, when we are looking for new pastoral leadership, be with us. Give your gifts to the call committee. Provide support for them by the strength of the membership of this congregation, lifting them up in prayer. Help us to discern who the person is that you have already prepared to be the new pastor in this place. Hear us, O God. You provide food that endures for eternal life. Sustain us each day with the bread of life until we are gathered with all the saints and feast together at your heavenly banquet table. Hear us, O God. Hear now the prayers of your people as they lift them up to you. I pray for all the people that's going to be able to their homes soon to be able to find a place to live. Yeah. All these prayers that we have on our hearts and on our lips, we lift up to you, O oh God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Yes. And some of us can greet at a distance, peace, and some of us can touch. So you will whatever you're able to do. <laughs> Thank you.
we have enough guitars here. <laughs> this is a song by Michael Jonkis. It is really a contemplation of the elements of communion. Um, it's called, We Come to Your Feast, and that phrase is repeated uh, in the chorus. And as you get familiar with it, uh, please join on in, that, in the chorus. <clears throat> We place upon the table a gleaming cloth of white, the weaving of our stories, the fabric of our lives, the dreams of those before us, the ancient hopeful cries. The promise of our future, our needing and our nurture are here before your eyes. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. The young and the old, the frightened and bold, the greatest and the least. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. With the fruit of our lands and the work of our hands, we come to your feast. We place upon the table a humble loaf of bread, the gift of field and hillside, the grain by which we're fed. We come to taste the presence of him on whom we feed, to strengthen and connect us, to challenge and correct us, to love and word and do. We place upon the table a simple cup of wine, the fruit of new labor, the gift of sun and vine. We come to taste the presence of him we claim as Lord. His dying and his leaving, his leading and his giving, his love in cup outpouring. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. The young and the old, the frightened and bold, the greatest and the least. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. We're the fruit of our lands and the work of our hands. We come to your feast. We gather round your table. We pause within our quest. 
We sang beside our neighbors. We made a stranger guest. The feast is spread before us. You bid us come and dine. In blessings we'll uncover, in sharing we'll discover your substance and your sign. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. The young and the old, the frightened and bold, the greatest and the least. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. With the fruit of our lands and the work of our hands, we come to your feast. Let's do that chorus again. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. The young and the old, the frightened and bold, the greatest and the least. We come to your feast. We come to your feast. With the fruit of our lands and the work of our hands, we come to your feast. Thanks to all the musicians today. Um, when we make offerings in worship, it's not just we, what we put in the plate, but it's also the other talents that we bring, and we thank you for your offerings today. It's great. So we do come to the feast. And uh, just a reminder of how we're going to do this, we're going to invite you to come to the railing when it's time to distribute communion. And uh, as you extend your hand, or place the bread in your hand, and then there's a cup with wine in it in the middle of this tray. And you can dip the bread in the wine, and then you may eat it. And um, I think that's what, oh, there's hand sanitizer for you, and for you, and for me. And so I'll invite you to stand. <clears throat> as we dedicate our offerings. And we are now on page 107. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And so I'll invite you to join me in the great Thanksgiving 107. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to it is indeed right. It is our ju duty and it is our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And so we remember 
that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. <clears throat> Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And you may come to the banquet, for all is now ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Given for you, blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. If my bread is your life, Lord, down. Given for you. The blood of Christ. If my call, your blood poured out. If in your midst body of Christ all joy is found, of Christ shed for you. if where I walk now holy ground, come Christ. and break the soul heart of stone. The body of Christ given for you. Start a fire in these broken bones. Here's my so it has been exposed the blood of to you. you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. Tell me of all I have in you. Because you are the one who holds my future. Because your love is what I'm searching for. Because you are the one, you are the treasure. Because you are the Lord. This old heart of stone, start a fire in these broken bones. Here's my soul, it has been exposed to you.
Thank you. Thank you for your gifts. That was really wonderful. So I'll invite you to stand for a moment, but Brothers and sisters, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Peace be with you. Amen. So brothers and sisters, the God of steadfastness and encouragement grants you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. And let's sing one more time. I think that's... That's <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the world, but it couldn't fill me, a man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough, and you came along and put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied. Still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is.